we go. It's recording. Okay. Okay. Why do you want to record? Well, let's see if you can share your screen. Okay. Got it. So I am Leora Berman. I'm the CEO and founder of the Land Between Charity, who is hosting Harry Gunson of EcoCare International in this session today. Um, there's a lovely picture of Carrie there. Uh, the Land Between Charity runs the Turtle Guardians program. Uh, the Turtle Guardians program is the arm that does all kinds of uh, mitigation and community, uh, community science to help turtles, our shelled friends. And we have been funded by Gunawenen Mishkiki, which is the Eastern Georgian Bay um, initiative that is looking after turtles in the Eastern Georgian Bay watershed. Um, we would like to recognize that we're coming to you from the traditional territory of the Anishinaabek Nation, uh, and specifically the Mississauga and Michisagi. Uh, nation within the greater Ojibwe Anishinaabek nation. We recognize the original treaties that formed Canada and these treaties talked about sharing the land equally. They did not uh, talk about sharing the water uh, with equal authority without molesting or interfering one another. We recognize indigenous people as uh, our brethren and the reason we were able as European settlers or settlers in general to settle this country. And we are very grateful for their generosity and tolerance um, and friendship in, that is recognized in these original treaties. The land between extends from Georgian Bay Coast to the Ottawa Valley. It is uh, central in Ontario as an ecotone. So this is the location in the headwaters of the Mississauga, Michisagi, Anishinaabek territory. The land between has the largest shoreline to area percentage or the percentage of shoreline to area in the province of Ontario. It also has uh, primarily or most the, the most rock barrens. And so who likes uh, rocks and who likes water? Well, turtles and reptiles in general. Uh, ectotherms need to bask and many of them are highly aquatic. And so the land between itself is a final refuge, one of three main uh, areas where as a refuge for turtles in Ontario and that's why we are concerned with helping turtles. Um, not just because it's a refuge but because turtles are such unique species. So for anyone who is new to herpetology or turtle biology on this call, um, I'd like to take a minute to tell you why these species are so important. First of all, turtles are keystone species, meaning they hold up entire ecosystems. Without turtles in aquatic ecosystems, those ecosystems and habitats, their functions, um, and all the species related to those habitats would suffer. So wetlands uh, are home to, or wetlands have important life cycle functions uh, or represent important life cycle functions for about 70% of Ontario's fish and wildlife. They are as dynamic in other parts of the world. Without turtles functioning in these habitats and in our environment, uh, wetlands uh, will degrade and all the species that rely on them. Turtles are highly imperiled across the world. About two thirds of turtle species or uh, Chelonian species are at risk in the world. Their populations are declining. And there are many reasons for that. Turtles in general have very low recruitment rates. So it takes them a very long time to replace themselves in nature. They mature very late and the, successful, the success of their offspring is quite low. Uh, we estimate given all the data that it takes approximately 60 years for one turtle to be replaced naturally in the environment. Adult turtles will still lay eggs for the entirety of their adulthood, and this could be hundreds of years according to amazing research by Dr. Ron Brooks in Algonquin Park, um, who estimates that uh, snapping turtles, for instance, could live up more than 200 years. Um, and so at a very low recruitment rate, we need those adult turtles to continue laying and producing offspring in order for uh, populations to be stable. Um, roads and road mortality is a major threat to turtles in Ontario and much of North America uh, for freshwater turtles. 
And so this is why we are hosting this session. It is imperative that we reduce the mortality of these adult uh, turtles that stabilize populations. And thus we have worked with Carrie Gunson, um, to, who is just a wonderful expert in all road ecology, wildlife on roads, to bring you this session. The other things we do in terms of turtle recovery and to help turtles is we engage in citizen science or community science as it's now known. And so we have programs such as nest sitters, wetland watchers, researchers to, to help us gather data and they are frontline mitigation. Um, they're a frontline mitigation uh, source, I suppose. So having turtle people who are patrolling roads, uh, actively moving turtles off roads when it's safe to do so is is excellent mitigation as well. Uh, we've also been piloting our own underpass projects or exclusion jump out fencing projects. Carrie will touch on those as well. And we have been piloting awareness uh, projects as well, such as these billboards. Um, the way we fund a lot of this besides uh, with the Eastern Georgian Bay Initiative and some federal grants is uh, through our calendar sales. So I encourage everyone to take a look at the Turtle Guardians website and purchase your Turtle Guardians calendar. This is the 2020, uh, 2022 calendar. Every calendar each year has a theme and this year is blockbuster movies. So we take all our ambassador turtles and we put them in really cool movie scenes and they're a lot of fun. Um, and they're great companions to have by your desk while you're working. Um, uh, and they're very inspiring and they help us pay for our road mitigation projects. So I'd like to give you a quick guide to what's gonna happen during this webinar. Um, so the poll that I've launched, if you still can see the poll, please answer the poll just to tell us who you are, where you're coming from and what your background is. Um, Carrie will be giving you the agenda that we're gonna go through and we're gonna have breaks throughout this. And during those breaks, Carrie will be posting brainstorming questions. When you answer those questions, if you'd like to answer those questions or have ideas to share or solutions to share, please put those in the chat. You will notice at the bottom, there's a chat box and that's very different than the question and answer box. The Q&A box is for questions you'd like Carrie to answer during or after the session. So you are welcome to pose questions anytime during this session, um, but during those brainstorming breaks, please put the comments in the chat box. So please note the difference. In terms of the questions and answers, um, the entire uh, audience can see those questions and answers. If you feel there's a question that's more important or you'd like Carrie to address first, you can vote up that question. So you can vote that you like that question or would like that question to be answered. So please go to that. We will do our best to go through all the highest ranking questions during this webinar, but in, we would like to answer all the questions. So if we can't get those questions answered today, um, Carrie and I will endeavor to go through the questions and send you the questions and answers in a document after this webinar. Um, so in addition to that uh, document with the Q&A answers, we're going to send you a follow-up email that has this recording. In the email, you'll see a questionnaire as well. This is an opportunity um, for us to learn from you in terms of what your experience is, where your obstacles, uh, what you think the obstacles are to um, mitigation for reptiles and roads and other species. Um, it's also for those who are not involved directly in mitigation to express your concerns and to help alert us to different areas of concern. So please fill out the question questionnaire and we will also contain, we will also have the brainstorming questions in that questionnaire for you to answer then if you do not feel comfortable answering during this webinar. Um, uh, please keep your eye out as well. In the next two months, we will have a video production on uh, turtle road threat mitigation, mitigation, and that's also going to be led by Carrie Gunston. Um, so this is a canned video that can be sent to different jurisdictions to help them understand the needs, uh, the aspects, the technicalities, and the specifications to help uh, reduce threats to turtles on the road. We also anticipate having more grassroots workshops in the field. Um, so this is maintenance workshops where we maintain uh, exclusion fencing, um, uh, other training workshops as well, and more interactive webinars. If you would like to stay in touch with us about all these tools and resources coming up within the email questionnaire, please just click yes, that you'd like to stay in touch and we will send you updates on all those materials as well as the research that we're doing. 
So I would like to introduce, introduce Carrie Gunson. Um, Carrie started EcoCare International in response to the growing need to mitigate road impacts on Ontario's reptiles and larger mammals. Although originally from Ontario, she began working in the field of road ecology in Banff National Park, Alberta from about 1999 to 2005. Banff now has six wildlife overpasses and 38 large animal underpasses, and these structures are being implemented on provincial roads in both British Columbia and Alberta. Carrie started working with amphibians in Banff, then moved to upstate New York, where she became acquainted with, acquainted with amphibians and reptiles in eastern North America. Carrie specializes in designing, installing, maintaining, and monitoring wildlife mitigation systems in Ontario and elsewhere. Carrie has installed over 10 kilometers of exclusion fence for reptiles and has participated in many grassroots projects. She is here today to share with us some of her most formative experiences in road ecology from the last 10 years of monitoring work conducted along Highway 69 from Port Severn to Sudbury. Today's presentation will focus on hands-on maintenance and adaptive management needs along Highway 69, um, but it will, that, that's the experience from our last webinar, but she's going to focus on, um, and she'll tell you soon, on uh, how to's, do's and don'ts, and best management practices for designing, implementing, as well as maintaining uh, uh, infrastructure to mitigate threats to turtles on roads. Harry, take it away. All right, can you hear me, Leora? Yeah. This will stop other screen sharing. Do you want to continue? So I'm gonna start sharing. Yes, please. And then I'm going to my PowerPoint. Thank you for that wonderful um, introduction. And I'm going to start from the beginning. And you can see that, Liara? Yeah, I can see that. Um, okay. For participants, if they're not muted now, please, uh, please mute yourselves. Thank you so much. All right. So my name is um, Carrie. It's not Liara, as it says in the screen here, I had to sign in through Leora's account, Man Between account for technical sharing um, of screens. And so here I am, and there's a lot of slides um, to go through. So I'm going to um, maybe move fast. This is being recorded, so we can, you guys can come back to anything and, and, and uh, watch it at a later time. Uh, so th this entire project, all these series of, um, workshops and webinars and the field day we had is being funded by the Eastern Georgian Bay Initiative. And so we will start with talking about roads and reptiles for about 10 minutes. It's already 1.15, so um, we will be a little behind on these times um, throughout the presentation. And we may go over the three o'clock. And so if you have to leave, you have to leave. As I said, it will be recorded. So you can come back later. There's a lot to cover. Um, we tried to, we're trying to brush through um, all the aspects and of a road mitigation strategy for turtles and reptiles in general. Um, but really there could be a two hour workshop on each one of these components. So as a background, Canada has eight species of freshwater turtles all of them are at risk. If you look up th in the threat documents, in the Casaro and Kozowek documents, you will see that road mortality is a threat for all seven of these species. And why is that for seven of the eight species? Then the eighth one is simply because it doesn't come out of water um, as much as the other seven species do to come up to nest. So turtles freeze in response to a threat. So if you've ever seen them on a road when you drive by, if you're watching them nest um, on a road, you will see that the turtle will pause when a car drives by and it will pause for um, a pretty lengthy amount of time until it feels that the threat is gone. So when that happens, another car can, if a first car misses it, the second car might get it because it hasn't seen it um, or any most of the cars aren't aware of turtles on the roads in the first place. Um, they also come up to nest on roads, perfect habitat for them. They're up higher, roads can be up higher, vertical alignment to the lower wetland habitat. 
It's perfect for the sun to incubate their eggs. They also don't have vegetation on roads, um, generally speaking. And so they come up and nest there. And then we have snakes and snakes are um, plentiful species in Canada. And I will come back to these um, reasons why, um, actually I'll, I'll go through that now. Um, snakes are killed on roads because they come up to thermoregulate on roads and they, you can often see them just laying still on a road. They are intentionally run over. They blend in with the asphalt surface. Smaller snakes, snakes are obviously more difficult to observe on roads or moving fast across roads, you might not see them. Um, and longer slender bodies are longer than turtles. So the probability of tires striking the length of a snake body is um, higher than other animals. Uh, this came out um, just the other day, uh, well um, put together document looking at the threats assessments for snakes in Canada. And in that document, um, there, I think there was 25 species of snakes in Canada and road mortality was listed as a threat for 23 of these species. We're gonna talk about snakes a little more um, throughout, but we're primarily focusing on turtles. And this is because um, we know more actually for turtles, for what works for turtles. Um, snakes and mitigation, where are we, are, where are we at with these with this taxa? Well, we know that um, reptiles are cold-blooded and that it is difficult to get them to go through underpasses in the first place. Uh, they're colder. And we've actually looked at passage rates and compared between turtles and snakes. And we find that snakes are more reluctant to go, to go into these colder underpass structures even more so than turtles. So snakes seem, seem to go in and turn around at a, a higher rate than turtles do. Uh, they're difficult to monitor, uh, same with turtles because they're cold blooded, but snakes even more so because at the entrance of the structure where you have your camera, they are moving around in many di different directions, more exploratory, and you don't know if they went through or if they turned around because they kind of disappear, especially when you have water or rocks under there trying to um, make them pass underneath the camera. Uh, exclusion fence. Snakes are able to poke through. They have slender bodies. The smaller slender snakes are able to poke through the, the, um, the mesh style fences that we have. Uh, snakes are able to find gaps and joins and fencing that have separated a little bit with um, the environment, the road environment. Sometimes um, exclusion fence shifts, comes apart. Um, larger snakes are able to climb fairly up to a meter. That's something we have to consider. Hardware cloth um, is more likely to be a detriment for snakes than any other animal. It's because they, it's sharp if it comes um, uh, off its framework in the exclusion fence environment, then snakes can easily become entangled in this. So we have to really think about um, the mitigation for turtles and what we're doing with the snakes. Okay, so I'm gonna go to my next screen here. So this shows some of the examples with snakes. They, find, they can find those small gaps and they can get through. They can find the small holes and they can get through and sometimes they can't get back out. And that's a problem because then they, they will perish in the fence. So some ideas, what we can do, we can um, securely make sure our joins are no gaps. We gotta pay attention to that detail, especially for snakes. And then we can do really, really, really intense joins at elevation vertical profile gains within the terrain to make sure that those gaps will not occur. This is an example of turtles in Long Point where it's a, um, a priority and community um, nominated priority place for roads and other impacts to reptiles. And we find that we have a situation in the Long Point Causeway where we have beautiful, beautiful intact wetlands, large, massive wetlands. And then we have cottagers who like to live by wetlands as well. And of course we have the roads. But in this circumstance, we have the turtles moving from this wetland right through here to nest and we're back again. So they have to do this every single year. So this is a huge problem for turtle mortality including there are so many people here in the summer when they are nesting that there is a huge or we haven't evaluated it, but we know there is a poaching threat. So turtles come up to nest. 
as I said before. And when they nest, some of their nests are predated, but they take a long time to nest on roads. They don't just come up, nest, take off. They're there crossing back and forth. I noticed this turtle on front road at Blandings at 7.30. I don't know how long it was there before I got there. At 9.30, it finally nested across the road four times. I had to watch it, make sure um, that the cars didn't hit it. Um, and I also observed um, the reaction of the turtles to the passing cars while doing so. So this is a, the biggest problem here is the crossing back and forth nesting and they don't move fast when they're doing this. This is an example in Long Point on Front Road where we're having a lot of turtles coming up. We believe up the steep terrain, some could be coming from the um, inland wetlands. We believe some are climbing all the way up the steep terrain from Lake Erie marshland and um, then their hatchlings have to somehow get back to where they're supposed to be. So this is a huge problem as well. We're having um, uh, some, um, this is what it looks like and we're gonna be hopefully installing some mitigation there. Um, what we do think will work well is having turtle guardian patrols helping these turtles cross in these areas. The traffic volumes are not significant um, in that we would be able to do something like that. So just in summary, um, I like to compare, I've worked with large animals in Bath, that's where I started. And now I'm with um, reptiles primarily in Ontario. And I like to compare um, uh, lessons learned from large animals because we've done so much more there for a longer period of time than we have done for reptiles. And, and, and I think we can take those lessons learned and we can apply them. And I will um, indicate that throughout this presentation. So with larger animals, exclusion offense is working quite um, uh, better. You see statistics of up to 80% roadkill reductions. And this is because this fence is easier to build than the smaller animal fences, and I'll and I'll tell you why as we go through. But the smaller animal fences need to be um, have no holes in them. So this is one of the main main issues here. We can have hole we can have mesh holes, but there is an apron at the bottom, and I'll talk about that later. Also, um, the spacing between structures has to be um, smaller, uh, more structures for reptiles because they move more. So this means that we need an integrated strategy of designated plus um, drainage structures uh, to be able to um, compensate for that spacing that we need. Uh, they're, they're, um, larger animals are typically warm blooded, are warm blooded, so they can move faster and they're not a, a threat with the changing environmental um, constraints that uh, reptiles would be. They, they can't move far in, in very hot days, for example. Poaching and data concerns are a problem for our reptiles. And so because of poaching, we can't display where our reptiles are necessarily in a public forum. This, it makes it difficult for people to do research, for example, um, in some cases. And then of course, monitoring techniques for reptiles is more difficult because they're cold blooded and we can't use the motion triggered cameras. This is us testing whether a motion camera that we use for large animals um, would work with reptiles and it only picks it up uh, on some occasions, not all occasions. So we have to make um, uh, um, amendments for the modifications for that. So, we went through monitoring actually in the last technical series, so we can you can look that up there if you would like. Um, so the, there's two kinds of um, strategies, so to speak, with road ecology and road mitigation. And strategy type one is using citizen science behavior um, or changing motorist behavior. It's working with humans to try and help these animals. So one example is lifting them up. Um, with our hands and when it's safe to do so to help them cross the road and to put up signage and hope that people will pay attention to that sign and perhaps look for turtles at that location or perhaps when they're driving elsewhere. These signs work better with public awareness campaigns. And Liara has already shown you her sign. This is on Monk Road. And I think this is a good idea and we need more of these and bigger and in your face, the better. 
Okay, so we will now move to um, the main topic of this presentation, which is going to be talking about crossing structures and exclusion vents. We got a lot to cover and we will take a break um, in about 15 minutes time after I talk about crossing structures. Exclusion fencing will um, cover a much larger component. It's more complicated. Um, so we'll go through this um, topic in about 15 minutes. So the way we set it up is we have considerations and we're gonna go through, we tried to group the considerations into the same theme. So this first slide shows the first um, uh, umbrella way of thinking about what you're doing when you're designing and implementing crossing structures for reptiles on roads to provide connectivity. You wanna know, is it a retrofit? If, it, if it's a retrofit, that means that it's existing structure and you're trying to make that structure work for reptiles. Or is it a road improvement maintenance project? That's important because if it is, you can earmark those, know about them, talk to the transportation agency and um, have them perhaps upsize your culvert if it's a culvert replacement project, or also help to integrate the cost of including specific features in the crossing structure that, that you need um, in, in that replacement project. And one of them would be exclusion fencing, for example. You could get the cost um, integrated into that um, process. A new road, obviously, um, new road is um, a pretty good scenario because you can really, you can implement designated structures as well as um, upsize your uh, drainage, drainage structures for reptile crossing. And so the second consideration is to look at your target species, obviously. So for reptiles, we are we know our target species, so that's what we're talking about. Um, we would want to look at whether the reptiles are aquatic or terrestrial, what we want, what type of passage. Um, snakes could be more terrestrial, but most of them, a lot of the reptiles um, will go through aquatic passages. We might want to integrate both aquatic and terrestrial passage in the structure. And so that shows at the bottom right here where you would want to put a, um, a ramp going in for terrestrial passage. Um, and perhaps uh, some you, you would promote or facilitate smaller mammal use in that scenario. And perhaps even some turtles would go through there. Uh, and um, then you wanna look at habitat adjacent to the road. And the, essentially you wanna look at whether or not you need these crossing structures for these animals. In some cases, you might not want them to cross the road. And I'm gonna show an example of that. This is an example of a project um, I worked on in about 2015 with Morrison Hirschfield on Highway 17. It was being upgraded. The road um, was being widened and we were wondering whether a crossing structure, there was a crossing structure here for hydrology, whether or not we wanted turtles to use that crossing structure because um, you can see that it's a pristine habitat on one side and it's um, a community which goes into more agricultural landscape on the other side. So in that case, we might not want, we might close that crossing structure off. And we also know we think they were nesting along this road. So they were coming here to nest and that's why they were being road killed. So we would put nesting mounds here and actually close the crossing structure off. We don't necessarily want connectivity there as long as we, we, we feel that they have their habitat on the north side of the highway. And this is an example of maybe you don't want connectivity um, looking at it as site specific here, because you're putting the turtles or the animals right into a community um, where there's dogs and people. So that's not necessarily, so we have to think about that. That's important, the land use and what's happening around the situation. Considerations, the next consideration, third consideration is the design of the structure, the size, whether you want open and or open bottom, open top, opportunities for openness, always looking for opportunities. So some clever ideas that have come up um, are using manholes or grates, grates for the open top and manholes which shine the light through. And um, open medians is another example. So this is an example of open top 
ACO tunnel. And this is an example of an, um, the footing in the Bruce Peninsula of a custom made crossing structure where they put a grate on top. It's an example of open median. Now, you, if you're going to have an open median, it, it creates more openness because now the structure is um, shorter. So there's more light coming in from both sides of the entrances and exit. And also you need to think about closing the median so that when they cross through, they won't um, go onto the road from there. And this is an example of Mexico where they actually have concrete um, closed medians. I don't know, think it was for wildlife, but it works well for wildlife. It's a very good example. Size, size is really, really important. We talk about size all the time. For, for larger animals, we know sizes and what works better because we've looked and monitored um, different types of structures next to each other. We still need to do that for turtles, but we don't um, necessarily have a perfect scenario to do so. One structure could have a lot of water in it and the next structure next to it is smaller, nice to compare. It's a dry tunnel. So it's hard to have the exact same sampling effort at those structures. So these are the difficulties that we find and why we're not getting information as quick as we would like to be able to make charts like this. Generally speaking, we try and keep um, tunnels for reptiles, turtles, um, up to at least one meter and up. Studies have shown turtles like to use 1.8 meters, 1.2 meters of have worked and then we've seen um, studies with three meter by 2.8 meter um, reptile tunnels that work well as well. So the beaver activity, this is becoming more and more of an issue with road ecology and turtles simply because they share the same beavers and turtles share the same habitat. So we have um, maintenance, uh, putting grates up on the crossing structures because they don't want beavers damming inside that structure. So, and doing so we have just, and I'm sure that fish biologists have been grappling with this problem for a long time. We have just closed off any um, connectivity permeability through that structure for turtles. So we're trying to come up with um, some, some solutions that will allow um, the beavers to keep their ponds, turtle habitat, and keep these grates open and not have beavers dam inside. And one way is by um, constructing trapezoidal fences around there, but actually creating a gap between the exclusion fence and the trapezoidal fence so that turtles following the fence come up and they can get through that gap, but beavers can't with their sticks and beavers tend to not move upland. So you need to make room between the exclusion fencing and that trapezoidal fence to integrate that kind of concept. It's an example where they've gone in New York where from An Angie Ross sent these pictures where they've um, built the exclusion fencing, but now we don't have the connectivity. So we need to figure that out through these grates. It's an example of beavers um, damming the, the bottom of a culvert, but because the culvert is large for hydrology, the turtles can still get through and we have pictures of turtles going through. So they've only dammed it um, a foot. So it's okay um, for, for wildlife passage. We can build diversionary dams and try and get beavers to dam elsewhere away from the culvert. And then we can um, integrate passage through that. So the considering consideration number four is the spacing of these structures. We need to consider um, having as many structures as possible. The more the better, um, up to 100 meters for toads. And from Europe, researchers saying 50 meters apart. For some salamanders in Europe, 50 meters apart. They don't move far. For turtles, we're looking at 100, 200 meters apart. To do this, we need to integrate drainage structures with de designated structures. I've come to so many projects where I found the um, drainage structures could have been integrated into the whole um, strategy and they weren't. And um, it's not the size that's the problem, I'll show some examples, but it's just the, the, the detail that we could use those structures, either there's too much water in them or there's, there's too much riprap put around them, things like that. And we need to think about that. Now, everything can be a passage for turtles, even if it's too small, if it's not that one meter, we still don't know if 
if a turtle's there, or if it, if some, maybe not, maybe they don't want to use it, but if they have no choice, they will use it. So you got to think, think like that. Alignment in the road pro profile is so important. And I'll tell you why, and I'll show you some exa examples of that. So this is an example of not integrating drainage structures in, um, in a road that had spent a lot of money. This is Stony Swamp in Ottawa, spent a lot of money on designated um, box crossing structures, which I'll show you a picture of. And then right next door, there'd be this drainage, but there's a grate on it. And the grate would have a bunch of debris in front of it. Nothing can get through. So, I mean, there, there is opportunity for passage here. So I cleared all that debris. Um, but people want to think about that, and, and we need to. That's the other side of that. So the turtles can get in, get all the way in, and then they're going to be blocked here. So that's not very good to have them go all the way through and then have to turn around and go all the way back. This is an example of a, a drainage structure that we need for turtles, and it was filled with riprap at the entrance. As a simple detail, um, an oversight, and so... Um, they came back and they put in um, smaller gravel between the riprap so that the turtles could, and other animals could more easily walk. I've seen riprap used in designated structures where they were put in wetlands and um, we, we've seen it all over the world. So this is, this happens everywhere. And it's just a, it's a simple thing because we're used to just putting riprap at our drainage structures. And so we have to just think outside of the box. Hydrology is so important. I've heard people say that um, agency within agencies say that if they're fully submerged, turtles won't use them. That's not true. We've had monitored this culvert when it's almost full to the top and we have turtles going through there. It is nice to have um, perhaps 75 to 50% water flow or water submergence because then we um, then they, there's more light and also they can come up for air if they need it. And so these are, they're definitely, but it doesn't mean that they won't use them if they are full, but we do want to um, maybe look at 50 to 75% water flow. And we don't want massive water flow either going through because that could um, force them to go in and they can't turn around and get out and things like that. So we can impede water flow simply by putting blocks in front of the structure, inside the structure, things like that. We also wanna consider when an animal's moving along um, for hundreds of meters along a fence, looking for a way through to maybe stop them, slow them down when they finally get there so that they will use it. And that's what these um, outward extensions are exactly for. And it's, it's quite important to think about that, um, not necessarily to block the entrance, maybe pull it out a little bit, but to, to I've read in so many papers where um, the turtles have frogs have just walked right by. Perched culverts, you see it all the time, and not just for hydrology, but you see it for designated crossing structures. There's scouring when the water comes through. This is an example of our field day on the right, and we built a turtle ladder or a snake ladder or, or hopefully wildlife ladder for the animals to climb up that perch culvert. And that's how simple it can be. Uh, just grab a pile of rocks and build that ladder. Here is a perch culvert. They had put fill hard mud inside the culvert. So we took it out at the front here and we used it to build up a ramp so they could get in because it was about, I don't know, six inches off a ledge for the, for the animals to climb in. Maintenance and a monitoring and adaptive management. We went through that in the last workshop, but we have to definitely consider um, this when we're building these structures and definitely monitoring so we can do adaptive management. These are examples from Noble Road. We have a crossing structure with mass amount of vegetation, Highway 69. This is a crossing structure for reptiles. We cleared that with a weed whipper and we made a path for turtles. It's important to do each season. And with that, we're gonna take um, a 10 minute break. We're about perfectly on time because we started late. And what I'm gonna say here is that people can have, can um, chat, but if you have anything to add to anything about crossing structures, these, these are just things to get you starting to think. We would ask that you put them actually, sorry, in the chat, um, the chat box at this time. Um, 
Q&A is going to be for the end when, when we have time for Q&A. Um, and I think uh, if Leora has anything to say there, I'm going to take a small break um, for five minutes and then I'll be back. Thank you for listening so far. Thanks, Carrie. So again, the question for any of the practitioners who and biologists that have had experience with and anyone else who might have some unique ideas, um, how do we make them more inviting these drainage culverts um, <coughs> and how can we open structures? Um, and again, if you have questions, uh, please put them in the question and answer box as opposed to the chat box. So um, solar powered heating lighting, that's a really interesting answer actually, the solar lighting. Um, I, I think Carrie can speak to that. There, there has been um, underpasses where lighting, artificial lighting has helped. Is that so, Carrie? Yes, um, amphibians, they've tried uh, lighting. Um, I don't know how rigorous the studies are. That's um, whether to say they, the, the crossing structure with light was used more than the crossing structure without light. I think they just shone light and then they use them. So well, we yeah. need some more rigorous studies for sure to look at that. But potentially Kim, uh, Kim who put that suggestion forward, I think that's uh, potentially a um, would help. I mean, turtles do appreciate openness and feel more comfortable with that openness and the sense of openness is based on light. Yeah. Um, so it is something we may even try at Turtle Guardians, uh, a, a lit structure and a not lit structure. If we can find comparable yeah. controls. And Leora at the bottom left in that slide is, uh, I forgot to mention, um, Zanny research in the States, I think Michigan, uh, but there's reflective um, oh, war right. that. That's, and that's even, yeah, that's even more passive and less uh, maintenance issues or less concern in terms of just having a mirrored like structure. That's that's true. Scent baiting. Scent baiting, maybe. Um, OK, other other uh, other ideas are open top. Yes. Uh, yep. Somebody just talked about the reflective flashing. And then the clutter within the underpass so that there is um, cover for snakes if they need, if they need snakes, if they need um, some cover. That's an interesting idea. Carrie, do you have any comments on that? Uh, yes, uh, definitely. Um, and, the, you, and some of the salamanders can go under the, the cover too so that they don't get eaten by the snake. <laughs> but yeah, cover, cover is recommended inside as much as you can. Okay. And then um, uh, other comments, uh, Rava, again, with the reflective materials. So very, very good ideas. Um, so less metal. So one person, uh, Angela Vanderaken, hi Ange, uh, has talked about uh, less metal is more appealing potentially. Um, so plastic or concrete is more appealing. Have you heard anything about that? Mm, yeah, I think it would be something to look into for sure. Um, I can't say offhand right. whether so, or not. Uh, Angela, if you have a reference for that uh, research paper that you're talking about, if you could share it either through email or immediately through the chat, we will put it out to everyone as well and include it in our portfolio. Perfect. Um, and then Jordan uh, Thacker has talked about noise blocking. Is there a way to help with yeah. noise? That would be good. Uh, buffer, get some so engineers noise, involved in that. Yeah, because noise blocking, maybe the debris or the woody woody debris and cover might help with noise blocking, but the noise from above, if anyone's lived above in an apartment with someone above you, it's really quite loud and it is amplified in that arch shape with the, uh, um, especially with metal. Um, it bounces off that art shape quite, quite yeah. loud. So yeah, I'm just gonna excuse myself for a couple of minutes. I'll be right back, okay? Okay, absolutely. Um, LED was another, uh, another option. And yeah, LED, uh, because it's in the blue spectrum and it mimics daylight. So LED lights um, are in, are actually blue and not white. And uh, 
all life, including ourselves, um, because we are animals as well, assume that that means that it's dusk, dawn, or daylight. We only see blue in the in the sky during the day. Blue is a very um, is not a normal color in nature. It's not uh, everywhere. So LED light being um, especially those long tubes would be an easy solution to encourage um, wildlife to feel comfortable. And um, uh, Rava, if your study on reflective flashings um, is available too, please share any studies or links with us either in the survey that you'll get later or in the chat box. So scent baiting is interesting. So Sarah has put scent baiting. Now, uh, there's definite evidence that turtles um, follow scent trails and have uh, really good noses for pheromones. So that is an interesting idea for sure. And I think snakes as well. Um, so that's, that's a really interesting idea. So um, Sarah, we're going to look into that and I'll, I wish Carrie was here to comment. I don't know any, um, any studies that have used scent baiting. Um, so loose leaf debris was another comment. And again, for everyone on this call, if you haven't entered or done the poll, the poll is still live. Um, if you click on the poll, you can answer questions about your past experience and uh, what sector you're representing, including if you're a volunteer. And again, I wanna encourage everyone after this webinar to fill in the questionnaire so we get a good idea of your concerns, of your experience, um, that we can share with everyone and we can share the results. So Carrie uh, will be talking about cost uh, for each of these different structures. So if Tom could put that question in the Q&A, that would be really great. Um, of course, concrete is the most expensive, but the most durable and the least uh, and the most inert. Um, and it would be great if uh, municipalities and governments would look at concrete rather than plastic and others. Um, plastics leach endocrine disruptors in water, so there's issues with plastics, but um, uh, Carrie will talk to that. If you can put it in the Q&A, Tom, that would be great. And food, a practical <laughs> food to bait turtles, I, if, if that's what you're talking about, that's, that's also interesting. So, um, it depends on an aquatic or terrestrial culvert in terms of food. Not all turtles can eat on land, um, but that's that's a fun idea. So Carrie, you missed the scent, scent baiting of turtles. I thought that was kind of fun and interesting. So pheromones uh, to attract turtles to, to go through the culverts. Yeah. Um, and again, I just want to remind everyone, uh, any questions rather than comments. So the brainstorming is for the chat and the questions, if you would please put in the Q&A um, and you can vote up the questions and we'll get to the questions after Carrie's presentation. So we can talk about cost benefit, different materials and, and their prices and their maintenance issues. So the questions related to debris uh, versus um, and cost, those can all go in the questions and answers. Um, and even, uh, not, uh, and there was a good idea about textured concrete. I think that actually could be a really good sound buffer. Concrete is, is a great sound buffer. Okay, I, uh, baffles, uh, similar idea of different textures. Baffles are a really interesting idea. Um, okay, there we go. All right, uh, take it away, Carrie. All right, I answered a couple, couple of the questions. <laughs> Um, also, before Carrie begins, the chat is also recorded, so we will summarize everyone's suggestions. Um, and you can also, if you haven't made suggestions now and there, and you've learned from this workshop and have a unique idea, you can put it in the survey that's coming um, in the email. Uh, or a story, always... pictures. Yeah. Um, uh, when when I work with the road engineers, it's amazing the creative solutions that they come up with. So um, as you learn more about uh, turtle biology and infrastructure, and you you have some of those creative ideas, don't be afraid to to try uh, to suggest some of them. There's lots of engineers on this call, and uh, so amazing creativity. Okay. All right. Okay, so you can still see my screen, right? You can see my screen okay? Yep. 
Okay, we're going to go into exclusion fence and um, forward slash wall. Walls are important to consider. Definitely, this is about barriers. This is about keeping turtles off the road um, and so that we prevent roadkill and funneling them to crossing structures. Hopefully gonna spend 25 minutes on this section. It's, it's, a, it's a doozy, that's for sure. So we've already gone over these types of considerations from an exclusion fence perspective. If it's a retrofit, we need to go out and select our site that will be conducive to installing exclusion fence um, to, and there has to be the crossing structures, or maybe we want to just put exclusion fencing in on one side of the road because there is trouble on the other side of the road that we don't want them to get at. That's possible as well. Road improvement maintenance projects, they are helpful, as I said, because they can integrate some of the cost um, hopefully into the project, but also it can um, help to uh, structure the road widening project or the culvert replacement project. You have the machines out there and so they could help prepare the landscape um, for the insta installation. New roads, obviously, you are given the opportunity to work with the landscape a little bit more, the um, linear route to um, perhaps install guide rails um, that you can attach the fence to or, or use the existing, any existing structures or build in those existing structures. And possibly there could be a large animal fence going up. So obviously excellent opportunity to integrate um, mitigation for smaller animals. And I'll talk about that. So um, considerations number two is looking at the um, placement more of the exclusion fence. So whether or not the um, structure, can, the, the wall can be continuous along the road transportation route. And lot, the main reasons why this does not happen is because we lose connectivity from access roads and from driveways. So we have to um, take that into account. If there's a lot of driveways, you may not even wanna consider exclusion fencing. However, there is some solutions for that, and I will look at them. And, and for large animals, we use Texas gates. Um, and so there's that kind of concept as well for reptiles. The placement along the road slope is very, very important. This is an example on Highway 401. We have slumping happening, and I've read this in papers all over the world where the fence has fallen or slumped and failed in specific spots where it is, um, too steep to hold. The substrate can't hold it. Additional structures um, we need to look at to attach um, the reptile fence, much more stable if it's attached to a structure that's already existing, uh, and the substrate, whether or not we're installing, um, we need proper substrate to put our posts in, to bury the fence. Can we bury the fence? Is a riprap there? Then that we need to know that there's riprap there. Quite often there's topsoil poured on top of riprap and we don't know that. So what kind of posts can we use for our exclusion fence? General rule of thumb is to have the fence, exclusion fence span the entire wetland habitat. And I'm thinking for turtles and then um, go beyond that. So we've installed um, in the beginning days in 2012, 13, exclusion fence, we didn't have time or budget to put it through the wetland and we just created a fence end um, issue where we had maybe even more turtles road killed than we did the year before with no fence. So we extended the fence, we improved the problem. Um, so if you don't have the budget to do it, extend it all the way across, then half won't work half as well. Half will work probably worse than what it was before. So we have to definitely consider all of the habitat. This is the solution. Um, this is from Europe. This is um, something we can do. It's a Texas gate example at the access road. This is on highway six and the Bruce on the left. If we put a, in a um, tunnel underneath there, attaching to the ex exclusion fencing on both sides, and then the exclusion fencing can go up the access road a little bit, 
or here you you can see on the right that it extended a little bit out but i would have put that a little bit more away from the road to keep the uh, the animals moving straight through and it's all continuous and it's open great so they probably feel comfortable going in there and they don't go up and over and onto the road so these are things that I, I believe this kind of concept was installed on Highway 6, but I haven't been out there to see it in the Bruce. If anybody has pictures or seen that, um, please send them. Harry, would you give us the name of that fence again and the material? This is an example from Europe. It's from, AC, it's, it's an ACO, ACO barrier wall. And um, what we used on Highway 6, there were supposed to be ACO tunnels that went on along the access road open top, and then they were going to join onto the exclusion fencing that was being designed okay. and, there. So and that's just quickly, Highway 6 in the Bruce. Right. And quickly, maybe for those who are new to turtle conservation and turtle behavior, um, can you just talk really quickly about how turtles navigate and how much they can climb and why they actually need to cross the road? Uh, we're going to go into that a little bit more. Okay, great. Definitely. That's good to know. That's um, great to know, yeah. Karen. You we don't have to do that now. That. So just for everyone attending, those are the facts. If you're not familiar with turtle biology and behavior, uh, there are reasons the turtles have to cross the road. Turtles are exceptionally good climbers. Um, they, they navigate the landscape uniquely and Carrie will touch on those. And so designing these with a biologist um, at your side is really important who understands these things. Thanks, Carrie. Let me know if I don't cover them. Okay, so. Here, this is um, a consideration for the exclusion fence. I talked about attaching it to larger animal fence. This is an example in the top left um, where the there was not any reptile fence attached. And it, had they put reptile fence, it could have done a dual purpose in that it could act as the apron um, that you often see with large animal fence now. Um, an apron is a buried piece, chain link. I'll show you a picture of that later. Um, it's, it's to keep animals from going under. As you can see, um, people, animals go under. And then um, you have different examples, bottom left of, this is um, something from Germany with Hans, where they have a concrete footing panel and there's drainage holes and that would, work for reptiles if it was just a little higher. Rule of thumb is typically 60 centimeters above for them. And then um, a top lip is even additional security that they won't climb because they um, have been seen climbing exclusion fencing. fencing. Uh, farm fences are excellent examples to attach reptile fencing to. And maybe you have to build it, but sometimes it could be there. In Mexico, this is an example of, um, on the right of way of every single highway in Mexico, there is this farm type fence, concrete posts, which are embedded in the ground and probably have been there for a long, long, long time. I'm trying to get them to use these structures for exclusion fencing and not build a whole new structure. The terrain is very, very, very important to look at when you choose your exclusion fence. This is from Bar Beasley in BC in the rainforest, you probably would not choose um, concrete. It's not accessible. It's very rocky, very hilly. She went with um, a like a pool shade cloth. This is also something they used at Long Point because of the conditions there and very wet and, and things like that. So although it might not last as long, it, it is away from, they don't have snow, but well, they do now. Um, <laughs> anyway, get my point, um, bottom right, uh they're you looking at wetlands so are you able to bury that in in those wetlands so what are you going to do to to get that into that wetland and to be secure those are things to consider it can get quite expensive and that's also canadian shield um rock and so that's what i'm going to say there the train um considerations number three is the train uh, that you're looking at. I talked about that already. If you have steep slopes, you have to consider that. Where are you going to place it along that slope? Safety constraints, it's different for um, every jurisdiction almost. Um, but 
they continually talk about the clear zone. The, the MTO especially talks about the clear zone. You can't have metal objects in the clear zone. So that counts out T posts. You need to know about that because um, then you're not going to uh, use T posts in your exclusion fence. So you need to know about that in the designing phase. Um, for, your, for your exclusion fence design. Drainage constraints is obviously a big um, issue on roads. We've been trying to work with um, draining with more storm events on roads that are, have been occurring. So there are gonna be washouts and there, that's always gonna happen um, regardless if you use mesh or solid. Uh, might happen more with one of the other, we're not exactly sure, but it happens with mesh, this is mesh right here. Um, a simple fix is to put riprap in the areas where you think that those washouts are going to happen, where the train goes dips down and things like that when you're implementing your fence. So another, because um, often we are not so much in Ontario, but there's um, barrier walls are a consideration for exclusion. And then in that case, you would, um, could put pipes underneath, which might not be um, as an expensive option as installing like sewer systems or something like that. But this is an example of pipes going underneath and this is a drainage pipe and you could um, put mesh on there so animals don't get through and close that off for that kind of issue. And here's an example of a solid barrier um, being transformed into a, a solid drainage, having drainage capacity um, with Animex or um, hoping to get this into the mainstream market by with their perforated panels where it will be buried into the ground. So exclusion fence considerations for are the target species, obviously, uh, Lior brought up. We, we might be blocking uh, turtles um, habitat needs with this exclusion fencing. That's why the crossing structures are important. But at the same time, they could be, have been nesting on that side of the road um, where you just put the exclusion fencing. So maybe you want to position your exclusion fencing so they still have access to the nesting habitat on the roadside. And if they don't, then you might want to um, supplement that with a nesting turtle beach. We won't go into that too much, but it, it is important and we need more um, design there and um, innovation because we are having problems with poaching. Again, another complication with turtles, if there's going to be poaching and people know, poachers know that the turtles are there along the roadside, they may uh, go up and down the exclusion fence looking for these turtles. So how do we make that, that work? And so um, opportunities to put these nesting beaches a little further away from the road would um, make sense. And we need Southwest exposure. So we need to know that there's not going to be forest and trees um, in that, around that nesting mound. So that's definitely something to consider. That's a whole nother workshop. And um, I'll talk about that a little bit more. Turtles can climb. So we need to ensure that we, um, that doesn't, we don't know how, how many turtles, is it just one or two, three individuals that are very tenacious? We can hopefully stop them from climbing by providing them crossing structures. Um, so we need to figure that out, how many of these turtles are actually gonna climb our exclusion fencing. And we'll talk about some of the exclusion fencing we're, we're using and whether they climb it or not. This is um, three, eighth inch, three eight in, inch mesh, um, just a little bit bigger than a quarter inch. So uh, I'm not sure if we have any observations of turtles climbing this particular mesh. So that's something to consider. And this is examples of the nesting beaches. So this is where we know that the turtles are nesting. We've put exclusion fencing in, we've cut them off to their nesting habitat. This is an example in the Bruce where they um, put a, a nesting beach. This is Priskeel where they built their nesting beach almost exactly like the road shoulder and it's compact and they've shown um, pretty good success, but they have to protect those nests um, because they have high raccoon levels because there's a lot of people camping and things like that here. So it has to be a, a, a integrated strategy, not just put the nesting in and then leave. Um, and this is an example of a brick sand nesting mound um, inside the exclusion fence in Simcoe County. 
budget is obviously going to be a big one. We'll talk about cost, um, who's paying, and how you're going to get the money. We're going to talk about a few specific examples. Longevity, the desired lifespan, best to go permanent in the beginning. Um, then you don't have to do it again and go through the whole process again. Do it right. Make them permanent and long-lasting. Uh, monitoring and adaptive management, obviously, we talked about that before. Maintenance, who's responsible? We're, um, this is a problem all over the world, not just here, about who will perform the maintenance. And it's more important because one small hole, the turtles will find. It's amazing that they are um, so tenacious. And maybe it's because they, they just really don't want to use those crossing structures. So we got to make those crossing structures work for them. And we've got to uh, make sure that we don't provide them opportunities to evade our, um, our systems that we're building, spending lots of money for building for them. Exclusion fence um, considerations, not just the fence itself. A fence end is some, so, so, so important. If you have a good, if you have good fence ends, um, and if you can't span as much habitat as you want and go 100 meters beyond and 100 meters beyond, if you have a good fence end and find those opportunities, then you can um, really, really save that fence end effect um, from happening, which is a huge problem. It's a problem with large animals, problem with reptiles. Jump outs. Jump outs are something that we've, um, with large animals, we've, um, uh, redesigned and we keep um, being innovative with them, with the heights and, and different details. And I'm going to go through that with reptiles. Fence ends, we can either do nothing, which is shown on the right, not recommended. Um, we can, if you're going to do nothing, at least make sure you span all of the habitat and then some. Tie into existing or engineered structure. Find those structures. It's at the other end of this fence, there's actually a bridge going across and they ended it right before. And if they extended it to that bridge, it would have been better. Curved end, not just a little curve end. I'll show you examples. Move, away, move the fence away from the road. So this is an example of a tie-in and um, an, into an engineered structure, wing wall, and um, it wasn't done properly. So what you can do to fix that Great, you know, temporary fix might even last quite a long time. This is put some rocks in there and you got drainage and man, turtles can't get through that. A lot of times on Highway 69 with these rocky outcrops, you would see the exclusion fence ending on the top. But um, a big no no is the turtle follows or the animal follows and follows right to the end of the cliff. And then they might jump. You don't know that. Well, we found that turtles did jump this cliff, it's five feet. Um, five meters. And um, we found three or four roadkill turtles here. So a better way is to perhaps tie it into the cliff. You got to assess each one, not halfway up. That won't work either. We found that turtles went straight down and in anyway to extend it away. And then I'll show you some other examples um, of what you can do with the fence and um, curving it and moving it away from the road. This is one moving it away into the forest. This was, um, it took a lot of work uh, to go into that forest and to remove the debris. And we're probably gonna have a lot of um, trees fall on it as well, but that's what we um, chose to do. And it's protected in there from snow at least. And um, it went in about 50 meters and snaked through there. So that's, that's one of the Cadillac fence ends that I've been involved with. Here's another one on Highway 7 with Animex. We tied it into a rocky outcrop here um, and I mean, they, they could still climb and go around and jump here if they so chose, but because we curved it around in a way, we're hoping that we loop them back. This is an example of a, a don't. So this is the MTO um, in their standard drawings right now. It needs to be updated. This is what happens on almost, um, I don't know, 80% of the MTO reptile fence projects. We have a little one meter loop back and maybe two meters coming back in. Paul Havens research has shown that a six meter out and in has diverted at least 25% of turtles back. And they didn't go back around because he had a camera. So he looked at that. This is in Vermont. This is a small loop back, not a J hook. I saw in the chat that not ideal. Uh, we want this. 
that's what we want. And that's what the research has shown to date. Jump outs, when are they needed? I've seen so jump outs every couple hundred meters along long exclusion fence projects. And I'm like, why are there so many jump outs? We don't need that many jump outs. If you have a good, strong, solid mitigation strategy with fencing and crossing structures, and you shouldn't need jump outs. Jump outs are intended for when you think an animal is going to get on a road and be trapped by the exclusion fence or wall. So keeping that in mind, when would that happen? That would happen when you only have exclusion fence on one side. That would happen when you only have a fence end that ends here and fence on the other side. So you probably want um, to jump out here. This is prom. This is an example of Big Creek Bridge in the Long Point. And we're putting four jump outs here because we're having um, crossing here. And, but we can't, these are access roads here. And so either we put those tunnels in as I showed you in a pre Texas gate type things here, or we have animals coming in. Hopefully they'll, most of them will use this brand new um, a bridge with a terrestrial bench in there to cross. Um, but if they don't, then we have um, well built and designed jump outs here. And the jump outs here are going to be so important to be designed properly. And I'm gonna show you that. Um, thanks to Dave Seaburn who sent these pictures in of a, a really neat design. Um, I was, I'd been there myself and I wasn't quite sure what was going on, but this culvert <coughs> is, a, is a jump out. However, either there's maintenance or um, if there's gonna be no maintenance, this jump out won't work because um, the dirt has come down and that means now animals on the roadside can climb up here and go and, and circumvent the exclusion fence, which we don't want them to. This is one is intact and the turtle used it the right way. And that's probably the only picture I have ever seen of a turtle using a jump out. They're hard to monitor. This is examples of jump outs I've seen along many provincial projects, but also I'm starting to see them a lot in municipal projects. And I don't like them at all. Uh, they're terrible and they're not installed properly. They're um, faulty if this, Two by four gets kicked out, they become dislodged. Now you got a hole in the fence. You got to cut a hole in the fence to put them in, which means that there could be so much opportunity for gaps to occur. So we're starting to close them all off. Um, and plus, there's way too many of them. So you have um, a, a strategy that doesn't work just because of the jump outs. So here we have um, jump out. At least this is temporary. It's probably going to be eroded but there's no cutting into the exclusion fence and, and messing with it. And we actually have a picture of a snake using a jump out. So that's good, garter snake. So the concepts from large animals is probably the best to use in, um, for reptiles. And that is we need a ramp for them to access and jump over and we need a barricade on the roadside. And this height is always so important. Um, this is on the safe side, the habitat side. This is for large animals that we've been playing around the height because we don't want deer to jump up. Um, some deer, mule deer are better jumpers than white-tailed deer. And what, what will they jump? What will bears be able to get past? So this is all considerations we've gone through. So for reptiles, 60 centimeters is good um, with an overhang lip. I'll show you an example of that being installed. Uh, for If it's for fox snakes, you need one meter here. You can have um, what you have for turtles. If you, have, if you have a jump out that's only 60 centimeters, the rest of your exclusion fencing is one meter for that target species. You, you, it's useless because you need everything to be um, uh, at the proper specifications for the target, target species. Here they put a bar up to try and deter animals from jumping um, that way, the wrong way, and they have a deflector so that when the animal comes along, it deflects into the jump out, which is um, awesome. So this is a concept that we need to look at in Ontario and lo and behold, um, the project in Ottawa, Stony Swamp has done exactly this. So we have a great jump out, very low maintenance concrete block with the lip. So the turtles come along, they can't get over. And they have the ramp here for them that goes 180 degrees so it can go up there and it can go up here and, and over and, and they will. And this is an example where the fence didn't extend to the crossing structure. So good spot to put a jump out so that they come out here and they will go there and then they're on the safe side. 
So there's a little bit of thought that went into that. And this is an example of a large animal one in Kootenai where you can actually excavate to get your height as well. If you didn't get your height um, with the, here, then you can excavate to get more height on this side. This is an example from Angie Ross in DC, New York. And this is using one of the ACO um, panel, fence panels. And um, I don't necessarily like this because small mammals can get up over there, but um, it could work for turtles. So it's an example of, but again, this height is so important so that they can't get up and over. Larger snapping turtles may be able to do that. Okay, uh, I think I'm gonna take a, a small break. No, actually, I'm gonna go through this if everybody seems to be okay. How are you doing, Leora? I'm good. I, I think we can we can barrel through. Yeah. Okay. We've got well lots still on topic with the exclusion fence. Yeah, we've got lots of questions to answer. And um, okay. after and this, if, there's a break. If people haven't looked at the chat, great conversation in the chat. And yes, I, I totally gapped in terms of baiting turtles with food. And never a good idea because you'll also bait predators of turtles. Um, and also changing, yeah. Food is never a good idea, and feeding wildlife is not a great idea generally, anyway. Um, yeah. So yeah, go for it, Carrie. Okay, I'll go for it. Um, exclusion fence and wall components. So we're going to go through um, variations between. I've talked about walls, and I talked about exclusion fence, and and more about the pieces of them and the installation and the costs with the mind frame of choosing what works best for your project. Okay, so framework, because it's, it's hard to, um, when I write these guideline documents, um, people want me to say, okay, just tell us what to do. I, I can't for every project, for every species. And it has to be site specific. We need to involve engineers. We need to involve road ecologists. We need to involve landscape um, architects, landscapers and um, fence contractors as well. So there's a, there's a lot going into this and um, there's a lot of thought that needs to go into it as well. So framework the, the, for exclusion fence, we're thinking not wall, just an exclusion fence at this point. We need posts, pressure treated. Um, we've seen pressure treated being used on the MTO projects and they, they can't use the metal T-post, so they go there. You could use T-post if you're allowed to in your other projects, if you have road allowance and things like that. Um, cedar posts used in, in, for large animal fence quite often. Um, consider outriggers or chain link or wood piece coming out. Um, you can see this bottom picture, that top piece of wood is um, also acting as a, possibly as a lip, if it works, hopefully the turtles um, it deters them from getting over. And then a berry bottom is something you need to consider. We talked about that. If it's Canadian shelled rock, maybe you need to put it at a right angle and then bury on top of that. You might need to put in some, um, some kind of pegs to hold it down into the, into the rock. So that means you might need to drill some holes. Attachment to the other structure, we talked about that. So the fabric is important. Fabric is a big one. And that's what pretty much goes into your framework or along your framework. Um, at your specified height for your target animal. There could be plastic and there's plastics out there that's solid versus mesh, there's concrete, there's aluminum. There's um, aluminum we haven't seen so much, but I'm gonna talk about that. There, um, there is hard wire cloth, which I do not recommend for reptiles um, at all because of entanglement. And then there's uh, chain link, which is steel, which is um, often selected because it's, it's accessible. And we know, and contractors know how to install it. The problem is with chain link, here's some chain link here, is um, snakes can obviously get through and so can hatchlings. Now, Lior mentioned at the beginning that adult, maybe we're looking just at adult turtles and that's what we're doing. So if that's your selection and your choice, then chain link would work. It's easy to put the outriggers on top of chain link. And this is shown to work well for adult turtles. Um, on Highway 24, attached to a 1.8 meter drainage culvert. And this is um, the MTO design we're seeing all over Eastern Ontario. And the purpose of this top um, piece of wood 
is to provide that lip to go over. I would maybe extend it a little bit more and attach a little more because the lip at the angle isn't, I don't think it's sufficient. Um, but again, do we know that turtles are climbers? It's pretty tall. This fence is up at, at least a meter. So, um, and it's small um, mesh. This is uh, chain link mini mesh, they call it. And it's being used here. We have seen some smaller snakes go through there. Um, that's a con. Um, but again, if we're looking at adult turtles, how many snakes are we losing that are going in there? So it would be, not, it would be good to evaluate that. This is a quarter inch um, hardware cloth made in China. It's very heavy gauge. Uh, I don't necessarily like it because if it, uh, if it becomes disentangled from the framework, it's now a very sharp object. We don't, we, we think that this doesn't rust easily uh, as opposed to what we saw in Noble Road. And I think in Noble Road, they had used um, a quarter inch accessible made in Canada fabric um, from Home Depot or uh, somewhere like that. And that rusts out. We know that rusts out in water. We don't use that anymore. But this, um, we haven't seen it rust out yet, uh, if, you know, eight years of being implemented. So th th these are the things that we're still looking at um, as they get implemented. And um, I talked about building the farm fence and attaching it, this in Mexico. And I'm not sure, well, this is a, an example of it being attached to a guide rail. That just helps tremendously with the um, getting, you have so much more selection of what you can put up um, at, when you have that, because you have you, your framework is there and it also cuts down on your costs for the um, installation. It's, it, it's simply attaching to something that's already there. The posts are hard and they're ex expensive part. This example of chain link on Highway 401, you can see the support cross wires on there and the outrigger for the lip. Posts. I talked about four by four inch pressure treated posts can be used. Um, these are eight feet. This is an example on the Highway 401 project that I showed you earlier. Concrete posts, this example from Mexico. And then these are cedar posts, I think. Um, this is in Kootenai. And this is an example of the chain link apron going in. Now you could use any kind of apron. If you're looking at reptiles here in Ontario, you would um, replace perhaps the chain link with something else. It could be a solid uh, plastic, could be whatever you choose for your apron that works for reptiles in that spot. Um, Exclusion fence fabric, not recommended, wood. Um, it warps and it's very difficult to fit into the terrain. This example of screen cloth that was blown out um, on several projects in Ontario. It obviously won't last um, the elements. And I talked about hardware cloth geotextile. Um, Freestanding geotextile would be a problem. Uh, there's so many different kinds of geotextile, pool cloths and things like that. Um, that could work um, in British Columbia when you don't have a lot of snow um, and it's tucked away in the forest there. It could last quite, actually quite a while if it's built properly. Uh, so solid plastic uh, is examples Animex and um, for the freestanding, they're recommending cross wires to help with um, keeping it up. Obviously you can attach it to a farm fence or build a farm fence or you can attach it to a large animal fence. Um, and uh, a con has been the drainage problem. So now they've come up with the perforations and you um, can get it with a top lip. You can put it top lip in if you would like. Um, tricky to, what was one of the cons there? Um, tricky to fit to changing horizontal and vertical train. You need to look at that. Um, install in warm temperatures is better. Uh, because it's plastic. So we know how plastic works in really, really cold temperatures. It's um, very difficult to maneuver. Um, the cost, including the posts, are $35 to $40 per meter. And it's manufactured in the States, so it can get here quite quick. Here's the MTL fence I talked about. I'm not going to go too much into that. I already described it in detail. Um, I'm just going to show you some of the costs here. Uh, caveats, evidence some snakes, can turtles climb? We don't know, requires cross bracing um, in, in routine areas. And these are the specs for it. And it costs $38 per meter um, as per the supplier. 
several years ago that's supplying it in Ontario and the materials um, with everything together, including the, the posts were 60 to $70 per meter for that type of exclusion fence. These are the ones that have been installed in Ontario that I'm going through right now. And this is an example. I call it the Waterton design because it was first used in Alberta um, with um, metal, corrugated steel pipe cut in half and put in the ground. And then in Ontario, we've seen it with the HDPE pipe in several locations. This is an example in Halliburton and the um, specs are there, 75 centimeters high. So it's cut in half. And I just wanted to show the costs of this type of fence is about $43 per meter. And that came straight from Heaven's paper that he wrote up on it. And one thing that um, we would do in the future as per Paul is to make these um, posts a little bit stronger. Slumping is, um, can be the issue there and maybe less riprap on the backside. Um, that's just my observation because that's pretty heavy stuff. You want to avoid slumping of your fence. And I talked about that before when you put it on slopes and things like that. So the, the Urtec has, but was installed in, this is a plastic mesh, was installed on Roseville Road in um, near Guelph, Waterloo. And these are the specs for it. Uh, pros allows drainage. It's ideal for uneven terrain, as we saw in Barb Beasley's example. And in some places in Long Point, it would work well when you need to install in the water. Um, some of the cons is if it's too close to the road, it will suffer road damage, um, snow damage, sorry, from snow clearing and um, could be subject to vegetation entanglement because there's mesh. So we would, you would need to clear the vegetation. Um, but then of course you need to be careful with weed whackers when you go in with this type of material. So the, those are the things to all the things to consider. Um, I've used this fence for um, when I've had beavers flood the wetland and the, the existing fence becomes submerged. I put a piece on top. It's very easy to attach to things. So I like it and I like it for washouts. Put it on the bottom here and it's not close to road, it works well. So there's, it's all about the application of the material to fit what you need to do um, and knowing what's available out there. So I wanted to compare all of these costs to large animal costs, um, large animal fencing, because um, in a lot of cases in Ontario, we need both. We need large animal and reptiles. So um, with just a little extra money, we can um, build both for U.S. and I should have converted that Canadian. So let's say it's about 100 to 110 dollars Canadian per meter for the large animal fence here that I'm showing you. And Terry McGuire sent this from Kootenay, um, from a Kootenay example um, in out west. And it, this is with one meter chain link for an apron. What steel or T post would vary the price a bit. And it's page wire deer fence that gets installed. You can see at the bottom here, you can see the chain link um, at the bottom. And you could, as I said, you could change that apron to the material that you wanted for your target species. So that's, um, so for 100 US, um, 130 Canadian per meter, we could have both types of fence. That's, sorry, I wanna make sure you know that's materials and installation. Whereas before we were just looking at materials. So this gives you a ballpark idea that of how much these things should cost. And um, we can go from there. Now, in addition to costs of materials and installation, there are other costs to think about right now, especially with everything that's going on in the world. Um, design oversight, you need to add 10% 10, 10 per kilometer. Um, and that's something to consider. Maybe that number varies a bit. Delivery. Uh, delivering um, heavy material is going to be something to think about for sure. And I, I'll go into that a little bit more. Installation will vary, in, obviously, in the cost. But we're, um, we're seeing high numbers for installation. I'm going to talk about that closer to the end. And a lot of it is due to COVID, supply chain and staffing shortages right now. But there may be ways that we can um, keep that number to a range that um, is practical. 
uh, and there could be contractor markups and monitoring and maintenance, of course, needs to be um, integrated into the overall costs of you know, installing this stuff, which hasn't been um, a lot on a lot of projects, hasn't been integrated. Exclusion wall components, I'm gonna go through this pretty quickly. Um, it's not as complicated as um, exclusion fence. It, it simply because it works better and it's just more expensive, but it works better. And we should definitely be thinking of just going this route instead of fidgeting around with all the other exclusion fences that sometimes have their pros and cons. Um, and whereas these just have pros, except for the fact that they cost more. So we have sheet piling, concrete blocks, armor stone, prefabricated concrete panels. The thing is with these is the maintenance costs are so much lower that um, you're really just looking at, if it's installed properly, you're really just looking at clearing vegetation. So this example from Vermont, it's, we've written this up in a couple of case studies. It's available on the web if anybody wants to know more about this project where they used um, concrete waste blocks. So the expense for the material was negligible, but the um, cost was in delivery. And the contractor um, that installed the crossing structures also installed the fence. So it was um, kind of all included. Um, anyway, so it ended up cost, costing, for the, the price I got was $96 per meter, um, but that includes installation and the delivery. So that's U US. And you, this is, uh, did I show a picture of what it looks like? No, not there, but from kind of an aerial perspective. So we've seen this in Ontario right here uh, in Whitby, um, Victoria Avenue. We have a very expensive wall along a wetland. So that's good. Maybe, maybe this one's overkill for turtle, but this could have been for pedestrians as well. Um, but for turtles, we obviously just need um, this kind of height of uh, two feet. And this is Jackson Creek, Jackson Lake in Florida, the famous study from Oresco. And the prices, he, he wasn't exactly sure because it was all integrated in one big price, but we we're estimating, he's estimating approximately $500 per meter um, estimated. No maintenance cause effective. He hasn't gone back, it was installed a while ago. He doesn't worry, everything works there. So that's the bonus there. This is an example from 2008 in Europe, in Switzerland, um, where they integrated drainage into the wall. So the drainage um, goes to the um, culverts, which is kind of cool. If you do a Google image of this site, it's actually still there because it's concrete and it's not going anywhere too fast. Installation considerations, the season that you're gonna install all of this is very important. You can get a post into um, frozen ground. So give yourself time and just understand that it's going to take maybe two or three years, especially now with COVID. A trench, trench is um, so important. How are you going to get that trench? Some, some places are much more difficult than other places. Access to the site, traffic control, and oversight is huge, so huge that we make sure that the water is put on the drawings and the design is integrated into the what's actually on the ground. And we need um, our transportation agencies and our um, engineers and environmental planners to get in there and, and ensure that that happens. Okay, so uh, this is good. I've made up some time. So we can have um, a good break here for 10 minutes and um, we will talk about these kind of things. So uh, Lear, I'll let you read them because I'm kind of, I need the break. Okay, and these are, the, uh, these are the questions you'd like everyone to ponder? Yeah, the brainstorming questions. So the brainstorming question is what goes where depends on a site-specific assessment criteria application, et cetera. Um, so uh, can you consider other fence types and barrier wall types? So this is just an open end. What other, what other materials can we use? Um, and I've looked at the poll right now, we've got 30% of the audience has no experience with turtles or turtle mitigation whatsoever. And so again, Carrie will cover, and if Carrie doesn't, I will cover why it's important that the turtle crosses the road, um, uh, how turtles behave and how they navigate um, 
it's really easy to underestimate a turtle and underestimate their needs. Um, so for now, for all the all, all of you, if you can think of other uh, fence materials, I can tell you the land between and Turtle Guardians, we've used steel food grade barrels from a soy plant, from a soy factory. So they're inert. Um, and so the arch shape is extremely durable. It handles snow load. Um, the good thing about the steel barrels is backfilling them even with gravel is okay as long because you can weld a foot to those barrels. So the lateral stability is, is inherent. The only issue is of course, rusting. And we are using those steel barrels, those half pipe kind of barrels as jump out exclusion fencing. So they, they're exclusion fencing and you can exclude the whole site or you can use them as jump out sections. Um, I have a slide on that, Liara. Okay, it's great. So, so that was that was my idea on a different kind of fence that is cheap um, and fairly easy to maintain because they come in one meter sections that we can hand dig in. So that's kind of fun. Um, but any other ideas? I've, I've talked to some engineers and they're thinking about wood. Um, and wood forms and making wood wood barriers. So open up the chat to anyone who's got ideas about materials and other types of fencing that we could use. Oh, great! Yeah. Someone else was going to talk about wood crib walls. Yeah, and wood uh, is a fun idea. Joe Crawley's in the picture at the bottom right there, just so you all can see him. <laughs> Hi, Joe. <And> Joe's <laughs> in the audience, I think, too. Um, wood, we'd have to think about wood, but definitely getting engineers involved to look at the properties of the material is so important. How they, because Canada is such a severe environment with our freeze and thaw cycles that, good luck. That's why I, I like the barrier walls, if that's what we need. And I also like the idea of a combination. When you say barrier walls and you're looking at two kilometers, well, barrier walls, what we've seen is they're going up in the wetlands and then, then you can use the chain link um, attached to them, right? Yep. Now, Danielle Backman's talking about I-beam rails and that's a good recy yeah. recycling, um, great idea. Um, so this, so again, if you guys have questions, put them in the Q and A. Um, so some standard concrete highway barriers, anything concrete is it, concrete's great. It's just really expensive. <laughs> and it's expensive to, um, to deliver, but they have, a, I, I don't know if, if people could talk to concrete. I phone, I actually phoned a Jersey barrier company and they gave me a quote. Yeah. Um, it wasn't as expensive as I thought. Yeah, I, I've thought of some sort of telescopic fence because the snow loads just kill a lot of our fencing and, and that um, frost, that, uh, that heave haw, whatever it's called, the, the frost, I can't think right now, but the changes in, um, in, uh, in the uh, topography that happened because of the frost and thaw. So, uh, um, something telescopic that could clip into two ends of a wetland would be great. Um, like tent material, but turtles, snappers will rip that apart. I, you know, I muse about this all the time and I'm sure Carrie does as well. I think um, we need to put a lot of these designs on sketches and have an in-person workshop and like go through them and have, yeah you know, people actually design stuff on paper. Yeah. So some ideas are, are recycled concrete. Others are thicker materials instead of my tent material uh, of, uh, of um, tarps, uh, uh, what's it called, canvas. Um, I wonder even if wool, like a wool, uh, what's it called? Um, like a thick wool would, would not turtles might not be able to rip a rip through that um it's all about snow yeah snow removal 
well, this is my telescopic idea of something you okay. can take down and, and clip back up. Before, All right, like, right, right. Yes, but, I do like that idea of- Yeah, really difficult in terms of the footing and turtles getting under those areas. Um, one engineer suggested to me that uh, you do something telescopic on a track, on a buried track that can easily be cleaned out every spring. Um, it's amazing when you get some road engineers together, how they think about these things. So uh, this man came up with an idea of a track, which was, which was interesting. Okay, I'm gonna be back in five. Okay, so I'll answer one question that was geared to me. Um, so one of the top questions was that, uh, I mentioned that turtles are keystone species in Ontario. What functions do they perform that makes them so important to ecosystems? So to answer that question, it's, it's a bit of a long question. I'll try and simplify the science. So turtles are, are basically scavengers. Um, and so younger turtles, um, the research shows that younger turtles, because they're growing, um, need more protein. And so as scavengers, they actually remove a lot of detritus or carcasses from wetlands and lakes that would produce pathogens. And so that, that's a really important function of turtles, uh, especially snapping turtles are the best janitors for these lakes and wetlands. Um, and uh, when turtles grow, they grow slower the older they are. Um, and they move between different habitats, terrestrial and aquatic, uh, through their territories. So they, they etch pathways uh, um, in these territories that they follow annually. Um, and as they move between aquatic and upland, uh, the nutrients that they've taken in gets cycled. So they're, they're, tran they're transporters of essential nutrients between terrestrial and aquatic habitats. The older they grow, they use less uh, specifically um, phosphorus um, and I think it's nitrogen, um, which would usually be in their bones. Uh, and so in their poop, as they're pooping along, they're, they're leaving these important gifts of, of nutrient cycling. In addition to that, the older they grow, the science suggests that at least 60% of their, their diet as they're adults um, and, and as they get even older is uh, plant material, seeds, et cetera. So as they ingest these seeds, um, a part of their guts uh, and the, the nutrients in their guts um, make these seeds viable, just like birds would. Um, and so they're pooping out these seeds, essentially growing new wetland plants and fish nurseries. And so that function of what would have been um, a massive number, massive, I mean, turtles were ubiquitous and quite plentiful and um, their declines have been more than 50%, at we estimate at least 50% in the last 20 years. Um, when I've talked to indigenous elders, they talked about turtles readily walking through their, their yards or their front yards um, just all the time. And so, if you can imagine that cycling of nutrients, that's quite important. But even today, um, the turtles we have remaining in these populations play these important uh, transportation roles of nutrients and seeds. And so that's why they're really important. So they clean water of pathogens, and at least they help to clean water of pathogens. So that's a, a really important function. And then this seed dispersal function um, means that they're basically at the base of aquatic, many aquatic habitats. They are the janitors and they are the gardeners essentially of these aquatic habitats. So I, I hope that answers the question in, in basic terms. Uh, we've got lots of research that we've summarized in blogs, et cetera, on the turtleguardians.ca website about the role of turtles in ecosystems. So that's, that's why they're um, keystone species. When you take that role away, um, you know, some fish are scavenge as well and some other aquatic species, but um, not many can compete with a, a really good snapping turtle in terms of the janitor role. And um, certainly the the amount of travel that they do between these different parts of their territories um, and that transfer of nutrients is, is almost irreplaceable. And so without those things happening, um, without the gardeners and janitors of our wetlands, uh, we, we will be in trouble. And that's their role in the ecosystem. Okay, Carrie's back. I was just reading some of the chat things and, um, you know, you see all those rock walls in Ireland or on Amherst Island. Rock walls could work too. 
Yeah, uh, that's very true. Yeah. Well, we used to build them all the time in the old days. <laughs> Get all the students out there, all the people on um, that don't have a job can do it. We'll yeah. have to court. We'll have to coordinate. <laughs> right. You and I, Liara. <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good. Anything all to right. say? Okay. okay. So the next section is process for implementation. Have I done that? No, this is the last section actually. And then after that, there's gonna be a, a skill test and question to see if anybody um, has been thinking a little bit. And uh, I'll get people to put their answer to that, I think in the chat and just would we'll get a couple answers and we'll see if somebody gets it. Um, and then after that, there's gonna be one more brainstorming slide and, um, and we can do a little bit of Q and A for, for let's say till 3.50. Does that sound good? That sounds great. All right. So the process is um, a whole nother workshop as well. In Ontario, we are seeing, and everywhere else, we are seeing uh, either grassroots led, which I love, and that's where I've actually learned how to install most of the exclusion fencing through grassroots and through trials with companies that have approached me and want to trial, or, and such as Lior um, testing, pilot testing her, her um, uh, metal. You, you, you know what I'm talking, I got a slide coming up on that. Um, anyway, so the grassroots is phenomenal. And I find that grassroots is really good for 500 meters and less, like the smaller projects. So if you're not doing massive, so you can get a group of uh, rangers together as I talk the students together that are looking for a summer job or being paid through Canada Youth Employment and you can get a bunch of them together and they can come and help you with shovels. You don't need machinery. So I, I love those kind of projects. They work well, the people care, so it gets done properly. We get funding from um, some of the habitat stewardship um, projects and funds. And we can also train people to do, to do, to install this at the same time. Um, hire contractors or some team of able bodies. Um, that's kind of the able bodies is what I'm talking about. But also if people, if the grassroots people learn how to do this, then they can also maintain the exclusion fencing afterwards, which until we figure that out, it needs to be maintained. So they have almost a, a share in the project. And so it's, it's looked after. Um, when the road agencies lead, which is fine for larger projects, it takes a lot longer, can take a lot longer depending on the, on the money that needs to be um, and the design process and, and the road construction that's going on at the same time, if there is going to be. Um, and um, typically with a road agency lead, you will have it identified, the project identified through the Endangered Species Act, um, which had more teeth prior to the government, previous government, with the previous government. Now we're not necessarily seeing, we're seeing a lot of things slip through the cracks. So we need people to, to really come up from the grassroots level and identify these um, and, and be on our governments to do something for these, um, for the turtles. Because I've seen many projects where um, the, or there's been a brand new, and I have a picture of a brand new big large culvert, and we know that turtles are there and being road killed, and then they didn't put the exclusion fencing, and we didn't need a lot of it. We just need a little bit, and it was overlooked. So these are the kind of things we have to um, identify and be on top of. Um, so when the, uh, we have a provincial significant wetland, we need those identified so that we can say, hey, you can't do that there. And um, can, hopefully we um, advocate to the governments to keep that policy strong so that we can keep um, installing these kind of mitigation measures. Um, and then with the road agency lead, typically a contractor bids on the job where, whereas he, in the grassroots parks or Parks Canada, they may do it themselves. Um, with their employees and their volunteer base, friends of parks often help with those kind of projects. So those are the differences there. Um, 
And you can see that this is um, two grassroots projects. This one's famous, this is Waterton. These are Parks Canada employees and their volunteers. This is what we did in Bruce Peninsula as well. And then um, school groups are great to get out. This one is in Prince Edward County. It was funded through a, um, provincial level HSP. And we are we installed about eight of us installed 500 meters of fence in three or four days. And it's well installed and it will last quite a long time. And then you have your contractors who did the bigger jobs and the MTO highway, as you can see here. Uh, it's very important to have oversight on all of these jobs. On the grassroots jobs, I'm typically the oversight person. And so I beat people over the head with a hammer when they do it wrong. But you do need that, no doubt. So road agency lead, the process. So mo many of us practitioners, consulting know this, but the grassroots people might not know this. And without knowing the process, then we don't really know where how we can get it done. So it's important to understand the process and that what, what typically is happening. And maybe the process is too, too much sometimes. These are things, all things to consider. Um, maybe if, if you're just doing exclusion fence, you don't need an engineering design company to come in. And, and to, so that's where the grassroots might be a little bit um, easier and quicker and, and less expensive. These are ways we can maybe save money and get these things done. Um, so road agency lead is uh, what they would do is they'll have a tender the design um, to typically an engineering expertise that can do drawings. Uh, the drawings is the main thing. If you're looking at cross structures, you might need a hydrologist. If you're putting, if the crossing structure is existing, that's bonus. You don't need that necessarily that kind of um, engineering expertise. So then you develop a conceptual strategy and the conceptual strategy is where you really need um, people to think through things. That Vermont example that I showed earlier was a conceptual strategy not done by um, road agency. They worked with the road agency. They had a person on there, but they did. They it, they actually had um, community people, but they had biologists from the community, and they had a road transportation guy from the state level that was able to feed into it. So they had a really good. Um, expertise from the community level, which you can find. Um, so that, that's just an example. So that, and that example, the Vermont example with that concrete block fence was done really, really, really well. And I'm gonna go into that in, in one of our last slides here. Um, the conceptual strategy is where you look at the whole landscape, connectivity, land use, and you try all those considerations that I went through this whole last hour and a half would be considered in that conceptual strategy. So you need to make sure you're looking at all those things. So you can see that you need um, some specialized expertise in, in that case to go through and to go through with detail. So make sure you put in a proper budget to go through all that detail so that you don't miss something. Um, it's really important to keep that um, um, holistic approach to everything that's going on and um, that you have the proper review throughout the process. Because after conceptual strategy, it goes to detailed design and details of design is super important. That's where all the little details are drawn out on paper and all the drawings go through several iterations and, and you have all your experts review it and you work with everybody you're consulting with, which is the road agency and, and the con um, the engineers and et cetera. And then the tender, the tender stage is so important. And I, I didn't know a lot about it until the last couple of years. That is where it goes out to the, um, to the, to the people that are gonna install it, put it in the ground. So you want those people to have experience that it goes out to, and you wanna make sure your tender, your competitive process is um, competitive. So you don't just have, uh, a handful of companies that are bidding on it and you wanna make sure that they've maybe done this before. There's a lot of projects now and people have done it before. So you wanna make sure that that's happening um, in, that, in that process. So this is an example of a pre-conceptual strategy that I would draw up. This happened to be in New Brunswick, 3.2 kilometers of fence. There was obstacles that you had to go around. There was a cemetery, there was access roads. There was a bike trail. And so we had to um, go through many, many drawings of trying to, that, that's the bike path that I'm following. And then the fence um, went around cemeteries, so I had to go into the woods and things like that. So it'd be interesting to see how that held up. It was actually built. 
um, in Cooch Bouge Quack and have been back for a couple of years, um, but they did have some snow damage on their fence, which is a big problem. I had no idea how much snow they had in New Brunswick, but they have a heck of a lot. But they had an integrated strategy of culverts, hydrology, and designated tunnels going together, and we integrated them all into the fencing design. Okay, so I put this big long list of how we can do better. Um, I guess it's kind of a summary, and I'm going to go to through some of these examples um, with illustrations. Um, and we talk, I talked about the tendering process, um, supervising oversight with the contractors, quality control measures in, um, into the tender document. And what I mean there is um, ensure that if, if something goes wrong with the installation, it's not done properly, that there's um, two years of they have to come back and fix it kind of thing, because we haven't seen that up until this year, we're starting to see it. Um, and, uh, and time is so important. Uh, don't, you might not get it in this year. So we, you know, with all your permits and everything. So maybe two, maybe it's two years. So don't go and get ahead of yourself. Design the road project for wildlife um, mitigation measures. So the whole road project, everything. Use what's there, use the guide rails, use everything that you see. If there's an access point, integrate that, figure it out and, and do the proper um, design. Because if you miss one thing, if you miss those nesting mounds or, or something, and then you um, maybe made it worse off for the turtle. Uh, so scientific research and development we've already heard about. And there has to be opportunity for adaptive management. And this is a problem with everything we do with the environment. Uh, there, adaptive management is supposed to be done, but it never is. And there's never money and there's never, so we can't go in there and, and fix what was wrong after we've monitored, it just gets shelved. So we need to have those opportunities and um, it's not gonna work if you know we're trying to do HSP grants and go around and fix all of it. So we need to stop that right there and put it in right for starters. And if we don't, then we need to be able to get in there and fix it. And, I, I, and again, if we have more trained people, the easier it is to do that. Um, so this really is important, these drawings. Um, you can see that these are two drawings I pulled for um, many projects that I've reviewed for guideline documents. And, and these are actually available on the internet. And I'll, I'll send the website for people that want to look at drawings. But um, you can see that, that there's a lot of detail in what needs to be done. So you want to make sure that those are followed. This is an example from the Vermont project. And if you look at these drawings that they drew up, there's a Moncton Wildlife Crossing project. Um, and I think they hired a, a engineering company here to help them get these drawings out. But um, they, you can you can actually see on the ground what that what's portrayed here in the drawings because it was just followed and done so well. So that that's a um, before and it actually looks like that after. So that's that's a good thing. They can be quite complicated. This is an example of a drawing from the Oresco project at Jackson Lake, and you can see that um, there is quite a bit of information and specifications for that um, wall that they built and um, other things that needed to go with the wall, such as drainage. So we need to update, I talked about this, update our and improve our standard drawings and guidelines. So the MTO is an awesome standard, but the fence end is not good and that needs to be updated and we need somebody internally to get on that and do that. It's been several years now. These fence ends need to be um, more flexible. Definitely, and something that fits with the current research. Scientific research and development. We talked about this. Um, Liara, the picture is in, talks a thousand words. So she cut the food barrels in half, designed this on paper, and she took the lid and made the foot and welded um, rebar. And so that this slumping problem I was telling you about, um, it sits nicely in there. So that's a really, really good design. So now we just have to mass produce this, figure out a way um, to do that and to, to make it accessible. And perhaps you only want to use this as where you want jump outs because it's a jump out design. And what we say there is that it, because it's below grade, the animals can come up and they can pop over. 
So that's when the backfill is in. And you can see that um, there's not a ton of riprap there and there's only topsoil, so she should be okay for, for slumping. And so she's gonna test that this winter with her people. And this is a missed opportunity and it's really, really sad um, because when you spend all that money putting in this beautiful crossing structure and a beautiful wetland and a very busy road without all the cottagers travel and you didn't get that little bit of fencing that you just need along here to include along the wetland for the turtles that are nesting that are coming up here, um, then it's a, it's a darn shame. So now we got to go back to the county who have, who have already, Simcoe County has already installed exclusion fencing. So they know about it. So we got to go back and, and beg and hopefully we can get some exclusion fencing in there um, in a year or two. Now, um, so we got Animex who is um, leading the edge on innovation. They've come up, they're gonna be coming, stay tuned for some new designs with aluminum. Um, and I hope I got the material right, perf, perf preform, freestanding. Anyway, we'll look, we'll, I think it's aluminum. And this is an example of an installation in Europe, not with this specific design, but another, similar design. So there's a lot of things to learn from if we go to Europe and we see what they're doing over there. I have an idea that I wanna um, work with a whole bunch of partners because um, it's not my idea. I've, they did this in Australia. It's a floating nest, um, nesting beach for turtles. And they, it's a warmer climate there. I don't know if it would work here with our colder water. Paul Johansson brought that up. Uh, so there's all these kind of things to think about, but wouldn't it be neat if we could have a floating nest and then the poachers can't get at it, um, but also raccoons might be less, um, uh, I guess, able to get to these floating, but there's also logistics because you have to have um, the weight and the load to get the stuff in there after you build the the sandbox or what, so to speak. So these are kind of things that we, you know, we, we get so much, so much money, but we have to install these things so quick. We just pour sand on the ground and we don't really think about how we can do these things better um, collaboratively. We have to work as a collaboration. So stay tuned. A lot of the, the guidelines I went through today um, are gonna be featured in an upcoming um, guidelines document with um, at the federal level with Paul Johansson and Ewan Eberhardt that are um, leading this. And um, there will be a chapter on turtle nest and protection and protection mitigation because that's being um, used more and more by nonprofits all over Ontario. Um, and so it, and we need to write that up, but also there's a bunch of stuff on exclusion fencing and um, crossing structures that we've already talked about. And so this is a skill testing question. And I would like people to look at this and put in the chat box um, right now, what is wrong with this picture? And let me know, this is actually um, an installation in Australia. What do you think is wrong with this picture? Generally speaking, if you were evaluating this, if you went out in the field, So Kara, I can read you some answers. Um, <laughs> so motorist behavior modification, speed limit reduction, um, raccoon swim. Um, <laughs> large no, that was too further before, yeah. Okay, large animals can get out. Uh, it looks dark. The fence is only as effective as the jump off. Um, they can climb the sides. Um, again, too dark. Expense is climbable. It looks like people are walking over it too low. Um, large animals again can jump out. The height may be too low. Um, free meal for predators. That's the great answer. Yeah. Uh, the opening is problematic. Um, it opens up where there's still cars. It's too short. Things could crawl over jump out lower than barrier height, too much vegetation. That's a good answer too. Uh, it looks low, too dark, 
the entrance is not in line with the directional fence. Mm -hmm. um, That's good detail. And the fence is missing on the other side of the road. That's um, good. Metal gets hot, no guiding fencing. Um, it doesn't funnel the reptile to the crossing site. Uh, no ramp for jump off properly. So, uh, what do you, do you want to answer this question, Carrie? For yeah. Everybody? Yeah, no, I'll, I, that's, that's a good summary. Um, I'll start with the raccoon swimming part. I, I know they swim. I'm just hoping it might deter them. I, I've seen them in water a lot, but, um, yeah, I don't, it's something to look at. Okay, now back to this. <laughs> uh, the main thing is, the first thing I would say, the primary problem is that this opening, I would have just kept the fence going over here, over the top of this, kept this chain leg and maybe cut it, which is what they did in Presqueel. They cut it, the fence to fit, and they went over top. Um, because smaller mammals, maybe amphibians can't, but the amphib some can jump, um, they, would, they would get over that and they won't use the tunnel. So that's the primary thing. The, the other thing about that, what people were saying with um, the, the other little detail things are all the, of value, um, definitely. Uh, it, it does look dark and in this particular circumstance they had to um, integrate a sidewalk in there. So they um, put asphalt, it should be open top and maybe along the road it's open, it's at grade. Um, so that's a little bit of a problem. Yeah, it's, it's, but if it was open top, it would be much better with the sunlight coming in. And um, you don't necessarily need this cover on the ACO tunnels. A lot of times you see that cover and that's what makes it dark at the, entering it uh, you can go without and then it's just it would be more flush with the fence if you took this cover off that cover has a little I think they're redesigning this now where they took this panel out from the middle because it was for amphibians but it that doesn't allow larger animals like turtles to go through if you have that, that panel there um, so that's something to think about and then uh, the vegetation should be cleared but that's actually not bad um, I mean, some of ours get really, really overgrown, as you saw, especially if there's frag there. Uh, David Seaburn raised his hand. Dave, you could talk if you want to. I don't. Are they allowed to um, take their? You're muted. You can unmute yourself, Dave, because you're you're obviously special. So you get to unmute yourself. Yes, <laughs> please. Uh, so he said it was a mistake. Um, that he raised his hand. So oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, we'll, we'll forgive you. Somebody else raised their hand. Um, I think that was also a mistake. Okay. So uh, is this the end of the session or we got a few more slides? Um, okay, There's, there might be one more brainstorming slide here. Hold on. Oh, it's a thank you slide. Okay. Uh, yeah. the, all the people that contributed their stories um, from colleagues, a lot of these photos uh, might not have had your um, credit on it. So I just wanted to say thank you. I tried to um, mention the people that helped me in the last couple of weeks that I've, I've phoned to put this together. And uh, I wonder if there's... Okay. Yeah, I think that's about it, Leah. Are there okay, we're other gonna, questions? We're gonna, put, we're gonna put some of the brainstorming questions in the survey that you'll get tomorrow in yeah. the webinar recording. I just wanna share the poll results with you. Okay. Um, and then if you wanna do Q and A, if anybody wants to stay later, they can. Yeah, now I think, I don't know if the polls, um, so I'll just read them out. We've got 8% uh, from the federal government for conservation. Uh, we've got 2% indigenous First Nation communities represented here today, 21% provincial government and 5% from the province that's involved in infrastructure. 9% um, are from the municipalities and uh, NGOs, 24%. We've got 17% from the public, students or educational institutions and 15% consulting. 
So that's a great spread of, of uh, the audience. And we've got 86% are from Canada, 11 from the US today, 1% from Mexico, and 1% from Europe, France, England, Germany, um, and then 2% from another part of the world. So uh, really dynamic. It's, it's clearly a really important topic today. And um, for those, because we've got such a, a and 30% don't have any experience in uh, mitigation for turtles on roads or any, um, any, uh, any experience whatsoever. Um, and so for those people, we just wanna cover why turtles need to cross the road. Uh, because I have many volunteers that say, just, uh, just use exclusion fencing. So the turtle shouldn't be on the road. Don't let it on the road. It doesn't need to cross the road. Well, that's not quite true. Um, so turtles uh, as I have, very, have high brain plasticity when they're very young and that brain plasticity um, curtails very dramatically after about the age of four or five. So in the first uh, few years of the turtle's life, and I'm talking about terrestrial turtles, they're etching pathways in their brain effectively. Um, and, uh, and they're etching pathways to the different parts of a territory that they will use for the rest of their lives. And part of that territory are the hibernation sites. Um, hibernation sites are often very different than seeding sites. Um, hibernation sites have very specific requirements in terms of ice cover uh, and oxygen levels, water quality for a turtle to survive. Um, and to access those hibernation sites is really important. Now, um, when, tur when wetlands are removed, uh, turtles will adapt, um, but turtles don't adapt well to being relocated. Um, very difficult for them to remember or etch new pathways. And so that's why turtles are not crossing roads, the, the roads are crossing, crossing the turtle habitat. Um, so they will, they are also very stubborn and will do whatever they can to get across that road. Often, if you design an exclusion uh, or a fencing underpass in infrastructure and you have one little mistake, whether it be a driveway through a private driveway that interrupts the whole fencing mechanism or a hole in the fence, um, turtles, or, or the ends not having, um, not being arched back further enough or not bounding the wetland entirely. So turtles mainly like to be wet and, and, uh, and they feel more comfortable in water. And I'm just generalizing across species here. So if we're generalizing, if you haven't um, bound the cross the habitat well enough and there's an open end of a wetland or there's a hole in the fence and they get on the road and the jump out isn't working, turtles can go back and forth between the two ends of the fence and you can actually create a, a real problem for turtles. So you're actually creating a trap, a death zone for a turtle, uh, for turtles that was worse than before. Um, populations are, can, be, can become locally extinct um, this is really important for municipalities to understand. Um, if, uh, if too many wetlands are filled in and there's uh, turtles end up hibernating together in whatever remaining sites, um, if the water level changes or someone fills in that wetland, you can actually create local extinctions. So, so these are much more sophisticated uh, projects than may appear on the surface. And they're much more sophisticated animals and essential animals to our future health and well being on this planet. So, this is why we put this together today. And I want to thank Carrie for all the information. Um, that's a lot of experience over many years distilled into two hours. And you can see there's a lot of meat in each of those topics. So, for Carrie to distill something uh, that you know, each one of the sort of sections we could have discussed or Carrie could have discussed each for an hour, um, whether it is materials, whether it's jump outs, et cetera. So, um, so uh, again, this is why it's really important for um, public works to work with NGOs or uh, biologists who have some background in turtle ecology biology um, and to design these things properly. And we, we, we work for a dime. <laughs> so we can leverage volunteers. There's lots of good grassroots ways to get things done. So I'm going to go through the Q&A, Carrie, quickly. Yeah, uh, I'm answering some of them. I'm yeah, we'll typing do, in. We'll do the top questions. So one of the favorite questions is, you mentioned that turtles are, uh, oh, sorry, has construction artificial, has constructing artificial turtle nesting habitats away from roads ever been experimented? And yes, the answer is yes. Maybe Carrie can expand on that. 
away from roads? That's right. Uh, nesting mounds? Yeah. Nesting yeah. mounds away from the shoulders of the road. Yeah, so that that's kind of the study design that we should do is um, put nesting mounds close to roads and put nesting mounds closer to wetlands, just understanding where they're moving from. Like we, we, we try and understand this first, the nesting, where the turtles are moving. And we, in most cases we know because there's been some kind of monitoring um, by Turtles Kingston or another nonprofit or university student or whatever. So we already know kind of where they're going or we can, we can get a sense of it from looking at the Google aerials and things like that. Um, so then we can strategically put them where we think they're going because we that's important um, because they're going to go back to the same spot they went the year before and most of the time that's on top of a road and um, so but the issues with that is private property if the um, property is owned by somebody else then you have to get permission and yeah. I mean that just takes a little extra effort um, but definitely um, yeah. you know and maybe if, 50% of property owners would be happy yeah, so, with something so like there, that. There is a level of nest site fidelity or loyalty to their nest sites, but they will adjust if there's a bird site in their pathway. Um, and I think Parks Canada has done some research on that. Um, but to answer that question too, Carrie's talking about private property. There's also very specific uh, requirements for nest sites uh, so that they have to be open and unshaded for a turtle to prefer those. And that also poses problem for erosion if in a flood zone yeah. so how do you secure those nest sites so there's lots yeah. again every answer or every it's never as simple as you think it is and every site will be different because of the topography and uh and the turtle using that site it's what that turtle where that turtle is usually traveling from and to um, okay, then another question. Can you speak more about the importance of airflow or light in encouraging movement through underpasses as this relates to underpass temperature? Is there a specific threshold for temperature, light, or airflow needed to promote passage through underpasses? Temperature? Yeah, temperature, uh, the airflow and light related airflow. to regulating, I think so. regulating the temperature. Yeah. yeah, and there's um, research that have um, alluded to that. And so we need more rigorous studies to look at um, those kind of parameters. Um, so that definitely a lot of research there to wire turtles more um, apt to go through than snakes, for example, um, when they're both cold blooded and um, maybe, you know, a herpetologist would be a person to start looking into that and, and helping set up a study design. Definitely the more open, the better. And we're just set, we're having problems with that, with herps. Their herps are definitely been a challenge for yeah. road ecology. Yeah, they are so tied to the environment in terms yeah. of temperature and moisture. And uh, there's new studies out about barometric pressure changing their nesting habitats. Um, so it's incredibly how they are, as in, um, some indigenous people have told me, they are representative of all the, of the earth. They are so connected to the earth and they represent all the laws of the earth that of course, temperature, light, uh, all those things do play a part. It, it'd be interesting to, so the more I think it is like the outside um, conditions and underpass, the better. Um, road salt concerns, Carrie. Can you talk about road salt concerns with some of these structures? Uh, with the structures, not so much. Just that road salt is a big problem, and when that's a whole nother ball game. That's water quality. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's huge, and there's lots of research to show that it affects the aquatic ecosystem and the animals that live there, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, so maybe that's what Paula meant and not just the structures. Yeah, road salt is lethal um, um, for so many reasons. Uh, but in terms of structures, I mean, our structures will rust out sooner because of road salt. That's what I can tell you. And concrete uh, spalls um, or can fracture if it's reinforced um, because of salt. But Carrie's absolutely right. It's it's lethal in many, many studies about road salt. And there are alternatives used in some communities across Ontario that use hops, actually, like beer hops. <laughs> it's pretty interesting. Okay, 
Um, so another question, how can we work with beavers instead of against them when we're trying to keep underpasses clear? Beavers are, we're still working on that. It's all new, um, new, I guess, concepts going in there for integrating that with road ecology. Um, so the, the best, it's, it's hard not to, to describe it without a picture, but uh, we need to get rid of the grate. So if you get rid of the grate, then what are you gonna do? Um, so we do trapezoidal fences or we do diversionary dams around the culvert to protect the culvert. And within those structures, you need to build in um, turtle passage uh, and, and keep the beavers out. Keep in mind beavers work in water, they have sticks. So they need more room than turtles do to simply um, swim. They need room to, to it, they're very um, uh, busy and, and hardcore and they won't give up. So, um, you know, they'll try and get sticks through anything, but they might deter them. So that's the idea is to work with the beaver. And so you take the trapezoidal fence a little bit further. Um, you have, if you have exclusion fence, you keep it um, one meter away from the exclusion fence upland um, where the trapezoidal fence around the culvert ends. So you have that gap. If you have that gap, that's where the turtles can get in and access the culvert. That's, that's the main way or the diversionary dam. If, it, if it's kept just at water level, turtles should be able to get just over top of the diversionary dam. Yeah. Yeah, um, those diversionary dams are wonderful. I've, they, they do work nicely. Um, yeah. The next question was how you get involved in citizen science. So anyone involved in turtles usually has a citizen science arm or a community science arm. Um, so the, the turtle guardians, we have about seven different ways to volunteer and um, monitor turtles. We've got wetland watchers, road researchers, nest sitters, um, turtle crossing guards, and uh, tunnel assessors. Um, and so we've got these kinds of things. Carrie has wildlife on roads um, operating in Norfolk, and we're going to be partnering with Carrie to bring Turtle Guardian stuff to Southern Ontario in the Carolinian zone. Um, I know Scales Nature Park has volunteers as well. Um, Magnetowan, Georgian Bay Biosphere, all of us have different uh, community science programs. So in your area, you can just Google um, uh, or you can just email us at Turtle Guardians and we can set you up. If we're not covering that area, we can uh, link you to who covers that area for community science. Um, so that's a, a great question. Road salt was another. Um, train tracks, a large concern as well as roads. Yeah, definitely any, so <laughs> there's lots of ways turtle can get killed. Um, and so Carrie, we can talk about train tracks maybe another time. Um, and other, other threats to turtles in terms of infrastructure. Maybe we'll cover that in another session because uh, the time is ticking. Um, also, people have asked for the names of studies. So uh, we're going to uh, ask you to uh, share any studies you're familiar with in the survey that you'll be sent tomorrow. And um, we will, again, answer these questions and share the studies we have with you in a document back to you. Um, so I think that covers most of uh, the main questions. Uh, the recommended gap size though for fencing, mesh or wire that can be used for snake exclusion to prevent movement of all sizes. Can you tell us about that quickly, Carrie? Sorry, say that again. I was just reading another question. Oh, the gap size for fencing for snakes to make sure that no snakes uh, get killed through fences. So what, you know, when you saw that, like the Animex had separated a little bit with the plastic pieces, uh, I would go in there and I would tie them. Any gap is bad. And I would put in like, um, they have a, a plastic ties or metal ties and I would just make that snug or I would take rock and I would build up the rock. Um, so those are the kind of um, maintenance and evaluation you need to do. Every gap is bad for snakes. That's why they're so difficult. Okay. And, and you know, think of the, any, if it's the size of a snake, a snake can get through. Um, and so the next answer you were busy typing away at, it's be, uh, the difference between mesh, uh, plas like see-through or opaque fencing and how an animal interacts with that. Can you just speak to that quickly? Yes, yeah, so uh, definitely solid. The, the um, research is showing that they will not 
um, climb because they can't three see through. Um, they're um, they can't smell, they can't see through the fence. The fence provides shade, so they might rest, and that's good. But um, and the you know you could have cover objects as well, so that they don't dehydrate um, for long sections of fence. Um, so this, there's a study in California that looked at this and, um, I guess movement time along a section of fence that was transparent, um, mesh versus solid. And they found some, um, statistical difference. I'm just looking it up. It's Bremi. So I can attach it. Uh, Bremi, California fence end. She actually looked at fence end stuff as well. Okay, and then a question about Animex or plastic fencing and how it stands up to harsh weather conditions, fluctuating water levels and snow removal. So it, it these these fences do have challenges in the snow. Snow load is a big issue in Ontario and that's why we're trying all kinds of things. Um, Carrie, do you have more to answer to that? Snow load? Yep, harsh weather and snow load for the plastic fencing. It's um snow load is a problem, so that's why you have to think about it for all, for all of the fencing. Um, so you have to keep your road allowance suitable. The further, the better, obviously. And um, Animex has some specialized installation guidelines for areas where you want to um, you can't move away from that snow impact enough. And that some of that's more of a below grade install, below grade because the snow kind of goes over. The higher, the more height on top of the ground is more impact from the snow. So you have to definitely think about that. And um, so that's why we have the cross wires, the farm fence. If you attach it to something, then you just have that stability when the snow hits it. Uh, and that's so important. Okay, so a freestanding fence with plastic, you want to attach it to something for stability. And we've got about two more minutes before uh, the end at 3.30 um, for the Q&A. Um, so someone's asking if uh, turtles went back to the safe side and got flipped on their carapace. I'm guessing that's with jump outs or that kind of thing. Um, uh, quick comment maybe that uh, that it's almost, it's always important to think like a turtle and make it <laughs> turtle friendly and so, uh, you know, big drops are not necessarily a good thing. Carrie, do you have anything to add to that? And then um, there's one more question we'll answer after that. Okay, that was kind of long. You lost me halfway through. Uh, it was just, uh, so someone had experiences with turtles being flipped on their carapace uh, from, and I'm guessing it's from a jump out or, or oh, something like that. Okay, um, so um, that's an example of harassment and things like that, uh, when that's higher probability at these, these fences yeah. and crossing structures. So I, I actually said turtle guardians, more turtle guardians, people watching yeah. out for them. Yeah, monitoring is really important. And also if you look at topography and if they're jumping out on an angle that they can roll, uh, turtles roll really well. Right. Uh, yeah. So that's a good way to resolve that to make sure that it just I like- I they can jump. flip over. They can flip over, especially if there's an angle for them, if they can leverage. So that's important. Um, yeah. Another question was about using trail cameras to monitor. Now, Carrie answered that question in our first session. So that's available through Turtle Guardians YouTube. Um, so if you just go to the Turtle Guardians website, uh, you can get the answers about the trail cam specs. Um, and uh, I think the rest we've sort of answered through this, but we'll send you answers. Uh, then again, if you would support our projects to try the um, the jump out uh, barrel fencing, we've we're hoping to do 15 sites if it works this winter and uh, next year. Um, you can buy our Turtle Guardian calendar and just because it's fun, so go to the Turtle Guardians website. Um, you will see there soon too. This morning we're fighting. We're actually protesting against a wetland being filled in with uh, one of the oldest turtles, or largest turtles we found in Halberton County. Um, it likely hibernates in this wetland, and there don't seem to be enough controls. Um, so if you want to sign our petition, you'll see that going on our website. And if you want to help us protest the filling of this wetland, that would be great too. So I want to thank everyone for attending and Carrie for all the work putting this together. If you have suggestions for more detailed, uh, specific focus workshops with Carrie's knowledge in the future, um, again, there's opportunities for you to tell us that you just, uh, maybe you just want something focused entirely on barrier walls. Um, just let us know. 
So thank you for your attendance and uh, turtle on. Have a have a great day and uh, keep up all the good work everyone's doing. Thanks so much. Thank you. Have a good weekend. <laughs>